Hi. It's good to see you both agreeing. Hi, how are you? Let me just say just very briefly, because we're all here to listen to the words of Kareem. Uh, Lauren and I became fast friends uh, about three years ago, and uh, and right away he wanted to share his vision for this museum. I will tell you that for all of us, it's a real plus. Uh, Bob O'Mealy, who's heading up the Center for Jazz Studies at Columbia University, what Lloyd Williams and I have been doing with the Harlem Jazz and Music Festival now, this is our 32nd year of bringing uh, uh, music and jazz to this community with our, not only with our festivals, with Harlem Week, where we service over three and a half million people a year coming to Harlem for what we call Harlem Week, which is really a 90-day event. Uh, only at home can you do that. Uh, so for all of us, it's really, uh, it's just really very important that we keep this American tradition alive. And again, I want to thank the uh, Jazz Museum in Harlem and all of you guys for connecting the dots. We think jazz and our music is without borders and it's for everyone. Thank you. The river, the river. Yeah. So, uh, it just occurred to me that you know, something that never changed and when the crew shows up and we got a double team of course. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he I, still beats us. And it's, yeah, we tried to get a third defender. <laughs> I, want, I want to ask you, I want to ask you to return to some of the, the history you were talking about in Harlem and and tell us a little bit about the ways that you're researching and trying to express it today. Um, you know, through different means, through both movie, music, and you know, how, how are you trying to make those connections now? Well, uh, just by going over the history of, of what happened, you know, I, I'm finding out so many extraordinary things. Um, I, I, um, Mr. Powell is here tonight, and it's really interesting because uh, I've heard stories now from uh, Chris and Cabela Calloway, who uh, told me stories about their dad. But this is something that's going to probably blow everybody in here away because they, they don't realize it. But in 1928, Cap Calloway tried out for the Harlem Globetrotter. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Cap wow. Calloway made the team. And Cap Calloway had to make a decision as to whether or not he was going to travel with um, his band or with the Globetrotters. I guess he, he, he did the right choice. <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, later on in his career, after the big band thing stopped, uh, he traveled with the Globetrotters and did a, a, he and a piano player would come out at halftime during Globetrotter games and, and, and entertain everybody. I mean, that, that is uh, one of the things I found out that, that just blew me away. He had played in high school went to Frederick Douglass High School in Baltimore, and then after that played professionally uh, in the Delaware Valley and uh, out toward West Virginia, you know, down in Virginia, in, in the, in the mid-Pacific, in the mid-Atlantic area. And uh, very few people know that. He also uh, owned a, a baseball team, and they traveled. Uh, saw a great, great photograph of Dizzy Gillespie um, playing baseball against uh, Cap Calloway's All-Stars. Um, the, the story that relates to Mr. Powell, though, was that uh, they, they were traveling, um, the Cap Calvary band was traveling, and they got to uh, a, a hotel, uh, to, a, to a city where the, the black hotel had burned down. <clears throat> so now they're there, and they got to spend three days there, and there's no hotel for them. So Mr. Powell had these uh, cards that's, that said that uh, if there's any problem, please call the State Department. And he, he, had, he was involved in uh, an, an Islamic-oriented uh, black nationalist group. And so he went to a white hotel and told them that they had to get in. And uh, they said, no, we're not letting any black people in this hotel. <laughs> he said, no, no, they have to get in. Call the State Department. He gave his car. And, <laughs> and the guy was perplexed. It was the night manager. He didn't know what was going on. So after about a half hour of argument, uh, Mr. Powell got through to this guy. And he went back out to the bus and told cab guys to put towels around their heads and come in the hotel and don't say anything. Just go up to your room. I'll, I'll get the keys. And he did. And they got to stay a day and a half at this hotel. And it's, it's, 
for the question. Uh, I'm sure um, Mr. Powell can give us uh, uh, some clarification on that if I have any of the details. You got it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, these are uh, the, some wonderful things I'm, I'm finding out about uh, life in those times. The basketball players and the, uh, the musicians usually stayed at the same rooming houses because of segregation and segregation, and all blacks had to stay in certain places. So if they couldn't stay at black colleges, like when they toured in the South, they would go and uh, to, to black rooming houses in, in the various cities where they had, uh, had gigs. And oftentimes, they, they shared the, the, the same facilities and uh, met a lot of the same people, knew the same people uh, when, when they traveled around. The, the, the 30s must have been a, a very interesting time uh, for all that happened. And then uh, during the 30s, to have people like um, Lester Young and Fats Waller and all of these people uh, doing their thing and uh, getting recognition for it. And uh, it must, must have been a, a really exciting time uh, for, for a lot of people. I, I really now um, envy my, my parents' uh, experience uh, so much more wow. now that I've learned so much more about it. I had a um, question for you. Why don't you say a few words about um, one of your uh, biggest, he was a big nemesis to you, at least that's the way they portrayed it in the press, and that was Wilt Chamberlain. You know, when you came out of college, uh, the big buzz in the NBA was, you know, this young man coming out of UCLA going up against Big Wilt. Uh, what was your relationship with Wilt on and off the court, and did you ever get a chance to go to Small's Paradise on your road trips when he owned it? Um, I went to Small, Small's Paradise when I left from my apartment uptown and, and hung out with Wilt. Ah. Um, he was kind of like, he kind of took me under his wing um, for a long time until, until I broke his scoring. <laughs> right, right. After that, there was some kind of uh, recrimination. A little, a little <laughs> when I was in high school, Will treated me great. Um, he would have me come and I, I'd sit in his booth at Smalls and he'd give me wow. a single force sling, which was a non alcoholic drink. <laughs> um, Will lent me his car so I could take my driver's seat. Wow. Down. I mean, he, Will was very nice to me, um, yeah. he was very generous that way. Will gave me some suits, and you know, Will's, we're about the same height, but other than that, my body is not like Will's. Right? So I, I couldn't wear these suits. But, I mean, he, he, was, uh, he, he was a generous dude. He, he, uh, I, I never felt any animosity to or, or from him until um, after I, I broke his scoring record and he started taking uh, shots at me. Is that right? Uh, you know. No. It, um, I didn't think that I had eclipsed Will. I know I couldn't do that. Right. I mean, I, I was able to do something that Will couldn't do, but Will did a whole lot more than I couldn't do. And he still holds those records. I, I don't envy him one bit. I, I yeah. always tried to acknowledge him. But um, I, I think he got a little, a little annoyed at, at, at what people were saying. What's it like uh, being friends with someone like that and then have to play against them on the court? Is, is it difficult to? change your way of thinking, like, oh, this is my buddy, but I got to beat him? Um, I, I, never, I never let friendship come with me across, <laughs> <laughs> across the line of the court. Right, right. <laughs> that was something I learned in high school. You know, you, you, you play high school sports. One of my teammates from high school, Arthur Kenny's here, and he can tell you. Wow. Um, I went to, I went to, I, I, I went to high school with a lot of Irishmen. And, uh, they don't play. When you get on the court, they don't play. You can be related to them, and they will punch you in your nose to get the ball. And that's how I learned how to play basketball, and uh, I'm glad I did. It served me well in the NBA. Wow. Yeah. You, you have understood the greatness of improvisation in music and in basketball. Who, in your mind, was the greatest improviser on the basketball court? On the basketball court, probably, although he was totally uncontrolled, um, uh, Pete Maravich. Mm. Pistol Pete. Yeah. Wow. Pistol Pete, was, he did some extraordinary things. 
Yeah. And then there were some other guys. Uh, World Be Free was kind of wild. And uh, maybe one or two guys. But uh, those two come to mind immediately. Yeah. Were there any particular uh, players that you did not look forward to going up against? Um, geez, the only one I could think of uh, was Bill Lane Beer. <laughs> and, uh, that's the only Bill, Bill would like shove and push and, and grab your jersey. Well, he was dirty. But he, he, no, he was annoying. <laughs> <laughs> I, I gotta say, Bill, Bill never tried to put me in the hospital. You know, right. he never tried to hurt me. Right. But he did everything he could to annoy me, and you know, he was always thinking about it. Uh, I, I remember seeing the film when. Uh, Robert Parrish slapped him down. Yeah. I remember, geez, I enjoyed that. <laughs> <laughs> I called our local news guy in LA, Tim Hill, and I said, Jim, you gotta give me film of, of, of the Robert Parrish slap down. And, and I, I noticed uh, Jake O'Donnell, who was officiating that, right. when the slap down started, Jake started talking to somebody like. <laughs> 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 They let him fight. He, That's he, right. He, he take, and he, he checked his shoe, and then he, oh, something happened. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, I, I wasn't alone at all. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, Bill and Beard managed to tick off of a whole lot of guys. Oh yeah. <laughs> Him and Rick Mahorn. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, the fans and I of us have what we think are the moments and the players. Well, for me personally, in terms of uh, professional success, um, the silence in, in Boston Garden when we beat the Celtics in 1985, mm. <laughs> you know how they say silence is golden. <laughs> that, that was platinum. And that, they were very quiet. <laughs> We're the only team that ever won um, a world championship in, in Boston Garden other than the Boston Celtics. The, wow. The Laker team. We're the only team that was, that was able to go in there and, and take the championship from them. And uh, that's, uh, that's something I, I will savor until uh, they put me in the ground. <laughs> <laughs> Could you tell us a little about your first uh, venture when you started your record label? Uh, I believe that was in 84 or 85 when you started uh, Yes, 84, 85, and um, I talked to people at, at MCA and they said, uh, hey, we, we want you to produce jazz for us. And I tried to get the, the right people together. And uh, then I went and asked them for money to do an album and they told me. That's um, too much. That's too much. <laughs> I said, wait a minute. And you know, I, I signed Dizzy Gillespie Wow. I signed Kenny Kirkland. Is that right? Yeah. It was a very pathetic thing to do at the time. That's yeah. right. And um, they, they said, well, you can do an album for $30,000. I said, I'm not going to insult Dizzy. I'm not even going to talk to him about it. And I didn't, and like, uh, my contract ran another year and a half, and they just let it run out. And I was really happy not to have him do anything yeah. under those circumstances. And you know the reason that I got involved in it was because they weren't hiring the young players that you know should have been hired. Um, you know the, the young guys that uh, were in their early twenties or even teenagers that uh, that the jazz world needed to hear. And I, I really that that annoyed me. But uh, I, that's when a whole lot of other small boutique labels started to come about and. Um, so I went and, you know, Irving Azoff, who was my boss at MCA, I mean, his claim to fame was the Eagles, and he had nothing to do with them musically, he just managed them. So, you know, it was like, um, you know, the, the saying, I will not cast um, pearls before swine. <laughs> I, that's, that's how I felt about it, and I, I, I was happy to back off. Yeah. Now, of course, Dizzy was a legend at that time. Um, and Kenny Kirkland was a you know, what, was, what was it about Kenny Kirkland that interested you? Well, uh, somebody, uh, I, I knew about his association with Sting, but somebody told me that uh, his jazz background was extensive, and uh, I talked to him about it, and, and it certainly was. Uh, so um, it, there, was, there was Kenny, there was another piano player I wanted to hire, uh, Onaji Allen Gumbs, extraordinary player. 
I wanted to hire him, but I, I couldn't find a way to meet him. So, but I, I met, uh, I got in touch with Kenny, and uh, finally uh, was able to make a deal uh, with his management people. But it, it, it never worked out. Since you're talking about pianists, I can't help but ask you. Um, I know anyone who picked up a, a, a Thelonious Monk just that came out about seven, eight years ago, roaming around the world, would find inside liner notes by Prima Abdul Jabbar. Um, can you talk a little bit about your introduction to Monk's music and how that affected you? Uh, it, it was the most extraordinary experience. Uh, to I, I mentioned earlier that uh, I would babysit for Ben Riley and then go down to the Vanguard. Uh, when his wife came home, and I get to just sit there and and, and really hear it. And um, I, I remember earlier um, there was a, a great DJ in New York uh, who uh, broadcast on WRBR named uh, Ed Beach. Yeah. Ed was awesome. Yeah. Wow. And uh, I remember one day listening to him when he did Monk in Depth, and Monk's music always made me laugh. I, I, would, I would smile, and uh, I, I just liked what he did, you know. It, so being able to go down to the Vanguard and meet him and watch him perform in person was just a, an extraordinary gift. And he, uh, he always referred to me, he told me I, I was a wild teenager. <laughs> he liked to tease me like that. He said, what are you doing down here? You're going to be chasing some girls with your wild teenage friends, you know. <laughs> so, no, no, I came down to, to hear you play. And uh, uh, just at certain moments, um, Monk sometimes would get up from the piano and start dancing, you know. And I, I knew his steps. So, me and, me and my friend Tyrone, we would, in the vanguard, we'd get up and start dancing. <laughs> and, and Max Gordon said, Look, no, you, you can't dance with Mr. Monk. You're going to close me down. We can't dance in here. <laughs> he was worried about his cabaret license because if you have dancing and you know, I had no thoughts. I said, no, we just, you know. <laughs> I said, no, 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 no don't, don't do that. So we stopped doing that. But it was, it was always fun. At one time, uh, Philly Joe um, came and took Ben's place. Um, ben, ben, went, ben said, oh, man, I got a night off. So Ben went home and um, I, you know, we were watching as, as long as uh, talked with uh, Rouse and Philly Joe um, and Larry Gales and told them what they were going to do. And then we went in the kitchen in the Vanguard and, you know, just we were in there BSing. And, and Philly wasn't with us. So uh, it's time for the set to start. The, the club was crowded too. And we went back out and Philly Joe was nodded out over the drum set like this. Just, and, and Monk said, Philly, Philly, Philly. Philly was out. So Monk said, F it, let's go. <laughs> so Monk said, one, two, one, two, three, four. And Philly came out of the nod, <laughs> right on the <laughs> and started playing. <laughs> and gave a great performance, did his stuff. The stuff he did with the brushes that was real slick, you know? And I was like, I was amazed. <laughs> and from then on, I, 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 was, I was friends with Philly. Um, but he, he'd come out to LA. Um, Philly, all right, Philly hung out with uh, Bella Lugosi. Right. <laughs> Philly wrote a song called Blues for Dragons. Blues for Dragons, that's right. Because he and Bella Lugosi used to hang out. They had certain things that's that right. they did together. <laughs> and, and, he, he asked me one time, you want to go up to Bella's? I said, no, I don't want to go to Bella's. <laughs> Miles told me that, that, that Philly, he said, don't, don't tell Philly where I live, because he got those burglar's tools. Burglar's <laughs> tools. <laughs> I, I don't mean to tear down Philly, uh, Philly's reputation. He, he, he's a wonderful guy. But. Yeah. He, he, there's some stories about him. <laughs> and this man, Mr. Man. Jimmy Heath, knows a whole lot of them. <laughs> Would you mind telling us about your, your latest documentary? On, uh, we had uh, Mr. William Roden, great sports writer from the New York Times, as uh, one of our guests for Harlem Speaks. And the topic came up of the whole thing with the hip-hop generation 
and their experiences or their non-experiences with uh, black culture as a whole, talking about visual art and particularly jazz. And um, your new documentary kind of examines that pretty in intensely, is that correct? Yeah, uh, it's an examination of how the Harlem Renaissance uh, affected uh, American life and, and my life. Um, just in the way that uh, hip hop is the sound and, and beat of uh, modern basketball, in the 20s and 30s, jazz was the sound and beat of basketball. And uh, the best basketball was played at the Renaissance Casino, which was a jazz venue and dance hall. So the people who uh, liked the game also liked the music. And um, the, the whole object of, of the Harlem Renaissance was to show America that, that black people had some worth beyond the fact that they were cheap labor. And um, uh, it was taken for granted in uh, the in the realm of uh, literature and music, uh, the, the arts, the visual arts and stuff. But in sports also, um, the same struggle for equality w was happening. And professional basketball w was part and parcel of that. Just like the Negro Leagues, people knew about the Negro Leagues and knew that they were trying to show the world that they were just as good as uh, the major leagues. Uh, the 1940 All-Star Game in Chicago, um, uh, Satchel Paige uh, showed everybody quite a few things, uh, striking out uh, um, the uh, uh, people from the, uh, the major leagues that he played against. And just to, to, to prove the worth of, of black people, they, they needed to compete and, and show uh, the culture at large that we had some worth in, in this society and uh, we should not be treated that the, the, the way that we were. Now, you know, uh because of that film that happened a little bit before for peace and the Wall Street Journal, and I was so excited because he pointed out to me that the New York Knicks were not the first basketball team to win a professional basketball championship in New York. Yeah. It was in fact. Everybody thinks that the New York Knicks is the first time that uh, New York has won the professional basketball championship. Uh, the first time it happened was in 1939 when the Chicago uh, Tribune had. Uh, I think, no, the Chicago Journal had a tournament uh, for professional basketball that was not segregated. Okay, uh, the major leagues were segregated, uh, boxing and all the major sports maintained a color line, but this tournament was open to, to all comers. And the Harlem Rens and the uh, Globetrotters took part in this tournament. Uh, the Globetrotters and the Rens played in the semifinals, and the Rens, the Rens won. And then in the next game, beat Oshkosh All Stars. This is 1939, and um, that's the first professional championship of basketball that was ever held, and it was won by a team from New York. Uh, that that was not the Knicks. Yeah. And that is history that's well buried. Um, are you you're going to dramatically reenact this? Oh yeah, we're going to try and you know as vividly as we can uh, tell the story because. Um, Nobody knows about it. I, you know, I, I talk to people about uh, t some of the uh, some of these events, and they're like, "Geez, I never heard about any any of those events." So it, it's something that has just uh, slipped past everybody. Uh, one of the reasons that the NBA uh, integrated in 1950 was the fact that uh, there was so much talent out there that they were ignoring uh, players that uh, had played either for the Globetrotters or the Rings, and. Uh, should have been in uh, the NBA, but uh, the NBA had a segregationist policy, policy for three years and, and, then, and then saw the light. Since we've acknowledged some of the great musicians, maybe, maybe we, should, we should make mention of some of the Rens players that, that are really key to the story. Okay, some of the Rens players. Um, one guy, uh, Fats Jenkins, played for the Rens, and he also played for the New York Black Yankees. Um, he got to know my coach, John Wooden, um, because when he toured with the Black Yankees, um, my coach, John Wooden, uh, at UCLA would go, he, he was a big baseball fan, and he would go to see the Indianapolis Clowns uh, Black, Negro League team play. And uh, he was very impressed with Fats Jenkins. They got to be friends and they ended up competing against each other. When Fats came uh, through Indianapolis uh, playing uh, on, on the Reigns team. Um, Iris Sage, 
uh, was a great tennis player. Uh, he was the Negro uh, uh, national champion uh, singles uh, tennis uh, player. And he also played on, on the rims. Um, there was Wee Willie Smith, who also played on the Black Yankees. And um, uh, Bill Quint, Bill, uh, Bill Yancey, he played on the Black Yankees also. And there's, there's one other team, I think, uh, one other player who played for the Newark e uh, Eagles. Uh, but they were all Negro League players. But uh, a lot of these guys uh, just played sports year round. I, I mean, we, we saw how amazing we, we felt uh, about Bo Jackson when he was the, the all-star center fielder for the American League and then the, the AFL um, running back in, in the Pro Bowl. Um, these guys did that on, on, a number of these guys did that right. on, on a regular basis. What are your impressions of a lot of the athletes in the NBA now? I know a lot of uh, people view players in the NBA now with a certain amount of concern for uh, either their lack of culture, their lack of history, uh, really just kind of a certain disconnect from the, uh, a certain type of reality, maybe, so to speak. Uh, what are your impressions of a lot of the younger players in the NBA now? Well, um, what you mentioned about concern, I, I think that has to do with the fact that um, not just NBA players, but this present generation is, is not getting the educational foundation that they need. I know already from that applause that the inner cities are really uh, the worst uh, That's right. in, at providing these types of players. You, you have situations now where um, a school will see that an individual has the potential to be a professional athlete and they will allow that person to go through school and not be subjected to the academic scrutiny that everyone else is and so consequently they come out of it uh, illiterate or semi-literate, but with a fantastic jump shot, and, you know, with three-point range. And they make it all the way to the NBA. And I, I can tell them because they're the players that I see all the time. I'm coaching with the Lakers now. They're the players that I see all the time, and the only thing that they have is an iPod and uh, one or two telephones. Um, I, I never see any of them with any books. They, they don't read. Um, they, they don't know what went ahead of them. Many of them think that basketball started with Michael Jordan. Um, it's, I mean, I, I wish I could get a, a highlight film of Marcus Haynes doing his thing and saying, do you know who that is? And, and I, you know, none of them would know. Uh, it's, it's, really, it's really sad, um, the, the, the educational uh, gap that, that's uh, happening now. Um, I want you to know that it didn't happen with my kids. I've, I've got four college graduates and I'm very proud of them. But uh, too, too many uh, parents have, have let the, the whole educational aspect of, of, of a child's foundation uh, founder, and uh, we're going to pay a price for it. I, 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 I'm, I'm waiting to see the, the next American, uh, outstanding American college athlete that becomes a Rhodes Scholar, right. like Bill Bradley or, or Pat Hayden. I, I want to see that happen again. I don't think it's going to happen again. I, I'm, I'm alarmed by it. You, you probably remember this. I remember about uh, the, the year that they retired Jackie Robinson's number all throughout Major League Baseball. Uh, ABC News Nightline did a big special on young black athletes who had no idea about the history of their sport. And one of the points, I, I, I shouldn't call names because one of the guys they interviewed was very famous, a very famous baseball player. And his answer more or less was, well, why do I really need to know who Jackie Robinson is? I make $40 million a year. You know, is it, is it hard to make that argument with a lot of these younger players? I mean, I almost kind of get the feeling that the, the less that they know, the more easy it is for the front office to control these guys and kind of keep them from becoming more uh, well-rounded and more intelligent, so to speak. I, Do you I, think that's the setup? I get the feeling that, um that they're trying to maintain the plantation system. Right, right, right. And I, I don't like it. Yeah. yeah. 
and you, you can't point to any one segment and say, well, they're doing it, or they're doing it. But that's what's happening. Right, you know, and right. And I'm, I'm very suspicious. And I, I think that comes uh, from listening to Adam Clayton Powell Jr. Um, say a few things and, and remembering it. I'm very suspicious. What, what do you think could be done at this point? I mean, because that's it, it, kind of an interesting point, don't you? I mean, if these guys are making all the kind of money that they're making, I almost kind of feel like they would feel that if they did get educated, that might inhibit their ability to make all that money. Well, I, I feel if they did get educated, they could use all of that money to, to make a significant change right. in the city. Right. Right. And I, I think that's one reason why people in my generation uh, didn't get that opportunity. I have, there is the same disconnect between generations when it comes to music and when it comes to culture, and it's, it's really pronounced. I know a lot of hip hop musicians and just young musicians who don't see the connection. Is, is that, I know that's something you're trying to, to look into and to address with this project. And I know it involves one of the people Chris brought up earlier, Ernie Hancock. Can you talk a little bit about how the two of you want to work together to? To well, uh, to me, what, what I see is like um, the whole aspect of the black community. Our, our, our music more or less typifies what, what's happening where the grandparents don't talk to the parents, who don't talk to the kids, who don't talk to the, great, to the grandkids. And you know, you've got hip hop, and then you've got the people who like R&B, and then you have beboppers like myself and Jimmy Heath here. You got the, the older generation uh, that uh, remembers Fats Waller and, and those people, and none of these generations communicate. They they don't understand each other, and we've got to uh, break through that stratification and, and, and make the the whole black experience in music ho uh, whole again, or at least have some ability to to communicate and and uh, and share the values. Um, these kids don't understand what Dr. King's values were. They, they know who he was. They don't understand his values. They, they haven't read enough. They, they don't under, some of them will go and see Malcolm X, uh, the movie, because Malcolm X got arrested. And for some reason, that appeals to them. Right, right. And they, you know, they, they wear his mug shots on, on their shirt, but they don't know what he stood for. And we got to get to the point where they understand what, what these people stood for and what they sacrificed for and what their ultimate goal was, because the, the Malcolm X that started out in the Nation of Islam was not the Malcolm X who got assassinated. And they have to understand that journey and that transformation and that enlightenment that, that happened in Malcolm that enabled him to reach out to all segments of communities, of, of, of a community, and work with everybody, uh, uh, Christians, Jews, atheists, uh, animists, you, you name it. Uh, he was willing to work with them because the, the interests of freedom, justice, and equality for all Americans superseded any sectarian definition. And uh, you know, we, we have to learn to leave that behind when, when, we, get, when we get things done. That's beautiful. Since you brought up Andrew King, um, I know when you were in that program as a student in the 60s, you had experience being a journalist in the room. Yeah, I, I had an, a, a wonderful experience. Uh, Dr. Clark knew Dr. King and uh, invited Dr. King to address the participants in the RUAC program, which is, a, which I mentioned earlier, was a, a property program that tried to show the kids in Harlem how to make it a better place. So um, Dr. King came up and gave us a, an incredible speech and, and told us that we were already we had already broken out of the previous mold because we were thinking beyond the established box and that we would figure out ways to make Harlem a better place. And all we had to do was uh, continue uh, looking, uh, rather in old areas or new areas, but we continue to search and, and, and things begin to change. And um, all of the press corps traveled with Dr. King. In, in summer of 64, he was news. And all of the press corps came uptown with him uh, to uh, 135th Street, where, where, we had our, um, where we had our meeting. 
And uh, because I was in the journalism workshop, I got press credentials. So I got to go with the press corps and uh, ask questions. I, I remember asking, I, I got one question in about, uh, they, were, they were trying to eliminate Dr. Uh, Dr. Clark. I said, well, you know, what about Dr. Clark? What, what has he contributed to all this? Um, just, just to make sure that they, they acknowledged uh, what was going on in Harlem that summer, because to me it was uh, very significant. And um, at, at that point, uh, my attitude about Dr. King changed because I, I always had thought that he uh, uh, was, was setting black people up to, to get beat up, uh, when actually uh, he, he was confronting the, the, uh, the, the establishment in a, in a way that was very embarrassing to the establishment. It took me, I, I had to wait until I saw the movie Gandhi before I understood all of it. Mm -hmm. But I, I finally got there, and um, uh, ever since that point, my, my respect for Dr. King has, has grown and, and immensely. And uh, it, it, it takes all kinds. If, if we're going to win this battle, it takes uh, everybody's uh, effort. Um, I'm curious. Please, please, please. I'm curious because you use the word plantation system and in reference to that syndrome that happens to the star athletes and you know, being marketed as products and glorifying one thing but really not emphasizing respect and knowledge. Do you think that same plantation system is true in culture for figures in the music world? And does that have a big contribution to the disconnect? Um, I, I think the plantation will be implemented anytime people in power can implement it. It, it doesn't matter where or when. Um, I mean, I, I can't say that it's only black people that uh, experience this. You know, it, yeah. it happens uh, across yeah. the board, and uh, it's something we all have to be, be cautious about. Yeah. Bring it back to, to music a little bit, I wanted to ask you uh, another two-part question. Uh, if, if you could name the band in which you would have most loved to have played in. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I would have liked to travel to South America with Dizzy Gillespie's band. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I, I guess uh, you know bebop is something that uh, I, I've enjoyed my, my whole life. All, all the musicians that I, I really loved um, started out there. Yeah. And um, I, I know Quincy Jones pretty well, and um, he's such a wonderful man. He'll tell you stories. So he, he tells me stories about when he first came to New York. Um, he met my dad somewhere along the line at, at that point when I was three or four years old. But um, just uh, traveling uh, as a, an ambassador for American culture yeah. uh, through South America, um, he spoke about the, meeting Lalo Schifrin. Yeah. Lalo Schifrin came down to meet them when they went to Buenos Aires. That's and right. I heard about this bebop music. Uh, maybe yeah. I can play. You know? That's right. Such, such That's great right. stuff. Um, um, I, I was telling you about the Joe Newman. Um, yeah. Joe Newman was a trumpet player. Um, Quincy said that he wanted to take the first solo, but that was always Dizzy's. And D Dizzy had a very, very wicked sense of humor, for those of you who don't know. So Dizzy waited until they got to Quito, Ecuador, to let Joe Newman take the first solo. And uh, Quito, Ecuador is at 13,000 feet. See, yeah. see yeah. If you try to play a trumpet at, here in New York at sea level, it might bust your brain. But at at 13,000 feet, uh, Joe Newman passed out, and they had to send him all the way back to New York to the hospital to, to make sure that he was OK. And, and Dizzy had a big laugh about it. Dizzy was kind of wicked. And, and I, I, I don't doubt that he might have tried to pull that knife on Cat and Cowan. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, so Dizzy Gillespie is a big man in South America. Oh, certainly. Yeah. Now, the second part of this question, uh, we've been asking this question to a lot of our, particularly our non-music guests. Uh, name, you already named your, the most, the greatest improviser you ever saw on a basketball court. If you could, name your starting five of great musicians. Mm. Wow, Give me a trumpet, saxophone, and a rhythm section. Trumpet, saxophone. And now I assume you would be the bass player. No, no, I'll, I'll keep myself out. <laughs> Why make things worse? Oh, wow. I, it, 
It's like, I, I, can I go in errors or, or I, um, trumpet, um, Dizzy Gillespie, saxophone player, um, Sonny Rollins, mm. um, bass player, uh, Paul Chambers, um, drummer, uh, e either Alvin Tones or Tony Williams. That, that, That's and, a good one. Um, piano, oh, geez. That, that's too tough, uh, uh, Bud Powell. Sounds like a heck of a band. <laughs> Dizzy Gillespie, Sonny Rollins, Bud Powell, Paul Chambers, and Elvin O'Tony. Right. Wow, okay, who's the coach? Who's the coach, geez. <laughs> uh, you're a wicked man. Um, <laughs> who's the coach? Um, um, Tad Dameron. Oh, look out. <laughs> Well, all righty then. That sounds like a heck of a starting five. Uh, at this point of the evening, we want to open it up briefly, briefly, because we know this can take all night. Uh, we like to see who in the audience has some questions for our guest of honor this evening. And if, uh, Lauren, if, if you wouldn't mind. There we go. Oops. <laughs> I'll do the third line. the agreement. Yes, Jerry Springer. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Share with us your favorite memory or your favorite story about Wes Montgomery. Yeah. Mm. Um, my, my favorite story about Wes Montgomery is uh, running into him at the airport in Milwaukee. He's from Milwaukee, and I, you know, I played there for six years. And uh, he and Buddy uh, Montgomery. Wait a minute. My, mic, my mic's up. Um, Wes and Buddy Montgomery uh, was picking Wes up at the airport when uh, the Milwaukee Bucks basketball team just happened to be going by. And uh, I, I got to meet him and, and, and say hi. And uh, just a, a wonderful man. And uh, Buddy used to perform in Milwaukee you know, at, at little clubs every now and then. Not quite often enough. It wasn't the type of town that supported the, the art that much. Over here, sir. Hi, Mr. Uh Without mentioning the other mention, uh, where do you think particularly um, that, the, uh, that the NBA and the players and the, and the attitude and the, and the court sense kind of change between the time that you and Magic retired and the time that Iverson appears? And uh, you know, who would be that transitional sort of player between those two eras? Iverson is the, is the embodied, is all of a sudden the explosion of the new generation, and you and Magic and, uh, are, kind of the, are kind of the end of the, uh, of the classic kind of players, and Michael's kind of in the middle kind of as a transition, but not exactly. I, I kind of see Grant Hill as the last old time, old style mm -hmm. player. Um, you know, highly educated. I'm jealous. He plays the piano. Wow. <laughs> yes, he does. Wow. And, and his wife sings professionally. Wow. We know sure. right. yeah. Yeah. Um, So I, you know, I, I admire Grant uh, in, in that sense. And I think what, what really what happened was all the money in the professional game has really screwed up the game for everybody. For the professionals, you got all this money drawing people into the league before it's. The right time for them to play before they've achieved the maturity and, and game savvy that they need to, to, to do well immediately in the NBA. So they have to come into the NBA and learn on, on, the, on the hoof. That's tough. Plus, it's taken all the talent away from the college game. So it's making the college game uh, less interesting because all their best prospects are going to the NBA to do what I just mentioned. So it's, it's, it's a very difficult thing. and. Uh, I, I hope they figure out a way to, to deal with that situation and, and make it so that the, the college game and the professional game can continue to thrive and uh, we can uh, get back to pr producing scholar athletes. I, I think they made the professional, the best professional basketball players. Um, Mr. Dubois, I heard about the fire at your, at your home in, in LA and I'd like to know whether or not you lost any uh, albums that you uh, treasure, and if so, uh, uh, which one was the one that you might have missed the most? 
I lost all of my albums. All of my albums, they were a big block of vinyl in my front yard. Um, the ones that I really uh, missed and uh, haven't really been able to replace were the uh, uh, like pirate copies of Coltrane Live in Europe, um, which I forget even how I got those. But uh, those are the ones that I miss the most. But you know, uh, since then, mostly everything has been um, put out on on DVD on uh, CD, and um, so it uh, hasn't been that that extreme loss. And uh, just uh, jazz fans all over the country uh, tried to help me out with that with that particular situation. It really touched me and uh, made me realize uh, how many friends I had that I didn't know about. It's kind of funny. I was going to I wanted to introduce someone who came in during the second half. That was actually the bass player for John Coltrane's first European tour, and that's Mr. Reggie Workman. I like to say first of all, see his greetings and thanks for taking time from your busy schedule to be with everybody here. It's really a beautiful thing. I want to say, like, I asked you, uh, as far as the young musicians coming along, I saw a few of them coming back in the back of the room. Have you seen anybody that you consider, that you consider, is going to carry the ball forward and not fumble? Um, it, it's hard for me to remember names at this point, because, but I, I was at the Thelonious Monk um, the competition uh, in the spring down in Washington. Um, and, um, Geez, John Clayton's son? Yeah, Gerald Clayton. Gerald Clayton. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, I, 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 I thought he should. He came out second. I, I didn't get. The guy who won was pretty good. But uh, I, I like Gerald Clayton better. Um, uh, certain vocalists I, I hear, and I say, who's that? And uh, you know, they, they know enough to go and, and listen at, at, at the foot of Sarah Vaughan and, and uh, Ella Fitzgerald to to get their chops. Um, Patty, even, you know, even Patty Austin did, a, did an album of Ella Fitzgerald songs and, and nailed it. Um, so uh, we're not being ignored. And that, that's the most important thing. Kareem, I wanted to ask you about, uh, I wanted to ask you about uh, what are you going to be doing with uh, adolescents in the near future? Because uh, about a year ago, I brought seven of them to see you at the, um, uh, at the Buffalo Soldiers exhibit at the Schaumburg. I want you to know all seven are in college. Three of them wrote a paper about you. Um, and uh, it was the excitement that you generated in them that I was able to use to, to help them more and keep it going. So I just wanted to know that you have effects that maybe you don't realize you have. Thank you. It's, it's interesting what you say. Uh, I know that I'm having an effect because of, of, of the books that I'm writing, and uh, people come up to me and tell me that uh, they put my books in the hands of certain kids, and it's helped them turn their lives around. And uh, that, that's why I did it. You know, I, the only joy that I've gotten, well, the most joy that I've gotten from it, I won't say the only joy, but the most joy I've, I've gotten from it has, has been, I, I, I'll get uh, an email or a letter from someone who had to teach history in the inner city, and they had no un, no concept of, of black history, and they read my book, and they, they were able to put their lessons plans together and, and do something meaningful for the kids that they had to teach, and uh, that that has made me given me the most uh, uplifting. Um, you know, it, it, it has made the, the purpose of my life uh, very clear to me, and uh, I, I'm very happy when I get that kind of uh, feedback. Um, I wanted to, I, you know that you're a legend in the NBA, like, but I wanted you to maybe speak about, uh, you, you also work a part of the well, Can you speak of some of those players of that day that we really don't really know about, like Earl Mango, PB, some of those guys? Well, there, there are a lot of guys that uh, played the game uh, when I was uh, a teenager that, that didn't get a shot because they weren't able to get into any college program. And um, 
college programs were the only way that you could get into the NBA. You had to get noticed that way. It's very rare that somebody could do what Wilt did, uh, which he left college and played for the Globe Drivers for two years and then went right into the NBA. But uh, he, he was well known. But in those days, uh, if you didn't have it together to get into a, a college program, you just uh, went by the wayside. And, and that happened so much. Uh, doesn't happen so much now. I mean, they, they're, they're looking far and wide for the next great players. And you've got players in the NBA from uh, Yao Ming is from Shanghai, uh, Luol Deng is from the Sudan, and, uh, Tony Park is from France. And, it, it goes on and on. And the, the game really has exploded worldwide in terms of popularity. We have a question from the back here. Yeah. Uh, hello. Uh, a lot of, I was in Cuba for a minute, and they got some dang like music just down here. Machito, an Afro Cuban jazz orchestra, a great musician. And they have a lot of jazz now in Barbados. And the guys come from. Thank you. I, I, had the, I had the pleasure of seeing Machito perform uh, up on, uh, there was a club on 86th Street on the east side, I think the Club Corso. Yeah, Yeah, I saw Machito and Ray Barreto there one night. Had a great time. Mr. Jimmy Heath. Great. Yeah. How long did you have that television show that my son named Jimmy? Wrote the theme for Karina. What television? What are you talking about? <laughs> was it just a video that, that no, it made? was it was an video. idea. It was an idea um, that uh, they were going to do a documentary kind of show on me, and uh, and Tony was playing with Freddie Hubbard, so they kind of collaborated on that. Theme for Karina. That's all he talked to me about. That, that's. That's as far as it went, though, Jim. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have time for a couple more questions. We'll take one from this side. Okay. Yeah. Where can we find um, see your, your movie? Where and when? Um, I'm hoping to get the movie out uh, to the public in June. The book comes out next month, uh, starting uh, January 30th. It's called On the Shoulders of Giants. It's my experience with the uh, Harlem Renaissance. And so um, it may, if we don't, we're, we're rushing as hard as we can to get the film out on time. We want to get the film out during the NBA playoffs. If that doesn't work, it'll come out in the fall. Um, the, the, it's, the, the film is a documentary. It's not a dramatic film. It's a documentary about the Harlem Renaissance, how it affected my life, and how it affected uh, American life. That time did you cast it and direct it or not? Uh, did I what? Cast and direct it. Oh, no, no. Uh, as a documentary, uh, you just figure out who you want to talk to and you got to go chase them down and talk to them. <laughs> we might do a, a reenactment or two, but uh, we're just going to show how uh, professional basketball got to be what it is. Um, most people ha have lost sight of uh, what happened and how the NBA got to be. Okay, we got, you know, I've, First of all, I have to apologize to all the people who can't ask questions. Don't kill me afterwards. But this, I think this gentleman can ask a question. Uh, Kareem, if you were speaking to a young group, what would you say was the most powerful effect that your coach uh, had on you, as you said? Um, the, the most powerful thing that Coach Wooden taught us was that uh, we have to prepare for success. One, one of his favorite say sayings was, Failing to prepare is preparing to fail. And he said that that has to go across the board. He said he wanted us to be, to graduate from UCLA and go out and understand how to be productive citizens. And if he didn't prepare us for that, then he was negligent at his job. But I, I'm pretty sure they're gonna make John Wooden the same. <laughs> this man is incredible and not, not a biased bone in his body. 
he came from southern Indiana, which is where uh, the Ku Klux Klan got off to a great start, but not not in his not not with his family. Uh, he was just an extraordinary human being, and um, I, I thank goodness every day that uh, I, I was able to associate with him. Um, the, the young man that asked that question, Bobby Hunter, he asked me about my mentor and uh, how important that was to me. And uh, I, I have to say that my, my high school coach, Jack Donahue, and Coach Wooden were the two most important mentors in my life, you know, other than my parents, and, uh, you know, helped me you know, understand a few things. Not that I always got it right, but you know, eventually I did. I just want to thank everybody and uh, of course thank the two really fine American institutions, the Jazz Museum and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, both of whom are very much at home here in Harlem. So, and of course a big round of applause for uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. We have to thank all the staff here at the Museum of the City of New York for allowing us to have this here this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, a great Kareem Abdul.